Thank you all for joining KSU's Franchise Management Speaker Series, Management 4124. Guest Speaker Series includes CEOs, private equity firms, leaders, bankers, entrepreneurs, and advisors. We are in a classroom on the KSU campus where the cameras unfortunately only face front and in the top of the ceiling due to student, due to student privacy requirements. So it may seem that I'm looking down and all by myself, which I think my students would rather that, that was the case. Um, my name is Jordan Crowley, Professor of Franchise Management. My non-professor life is as an independent equity sponsor acquiring businesses, also as a consultant and a senior, past senior leader with companies such as McDonald's, Arby's, Home Depot, and more. Today, we are extremely excited to have one of the titans in the industry, Darren Harris. Darren is CEO of Jack in the Box. Jack in the Box is over 2,200 restaurants, representing more than 4 billion in system-wide sales and nearly 500,000 employees. Previously, was Darren was also CEO for Regis North America and CC's, CEO for Primrose Schools, and on the senior leadership teams at Arby's and Captain B's. If that wasn't enough for one person, Darren has also been a multi-unit franchisee of both Papa John's and Qdoba. Quite simply, Darren is one of the most influential and exceptional leaders in the franchise space, and in my personal experience, an amazing person. We're so fortunate to have you today, and thank you for joining us, Darren. Uh, thank you, Jordan. Thanks for the, the kind introduction. No, absolutely. So I think the best way to start is just kind of share your personal background, kind of share, you know, walk us through how you, how you ended up at, at Jack and, and, and perhaps some of the things that um, were interesting along the way. Yeah, sure. Well, let me start with how I, I got into the industry. I think that'll be interesting for the class. I, um, you know, when I was in grad school, um, I was working for the Montreal Expos and trying to figure out how to get, you know, people to actually come to a game in South Florida of a team that was based in Canada. And so we had, you know, we didn't have a lot of people that would show up and often it was snowbirds that were attending the game. So I'm like, we've got to figure out a way to attract people to come to the games. And so, you know, I started, I grew up in Wichita, Kansas, where Pizza was founded. So I knew a lot of executives there that I had played baseball with their, their children. So I started calling them. I'm like, hey, can we get a pizza hut at, at the stadium? I'd like to you know, give better food to the, the business community that's nearby and I'll give away tickets just to get them to the game and have a good experience. And through this, I built a relationship with the gentleman on the phone and started talking to him about maybe my future career to be in sports, sports marketing or some other form of, you know, working within uh, an organization the size of Pizza Hut and struck up a relationship. And in that relationship, I learned a little bit about um, what Pizza Hut was doing in the future of what they called co-branding. And so co-branding is putting a restaurant and a hotel and an airport, a convenience store. And so I left the conversation, I went back and I started doing some research and ultimately did my grad school thesis on um, co-branding. And so um, from that grad school thesis, I uh, was introduced to another gentleman at Pizza Hut that I left a message for every Friday at 2 p.m. for almost six months telling him all the things about myself, about what I was learning in co-branding. And ultimately through that, he hired me to basically do franchising for Pizza Hut for non-traditional locations. And at that time, many of you have probably seen a Pizza Hut at airport. There was one around the globe. Uh, there was one in a convenience store. There was one in a Home Depot and one in a university. And so now you see them everywhere. But at that point, there were four of them. And two years later, I, I was hired once once he finally called me back, he, he invited me in over the holiday break and hired me on the spot. And two years later, we ended up with 200 locations uh, in those type of venues. So that was how I got started. And so basically you ran special points of distribution, but Yes, non-traditional locations. But it must have been tough to give up baseball. <laughs> Always tough to, I don't think I've ever given up baseball. I'm still thinking I can go out there and play, but, but uh, no, it was definitely tough to give up baseball, but um, what I found was that uh, the franchising community offered me something that was different and it's still competitive. And, and more than anything, what I was looking for is that people that I could have a relationship with, but also be challenged to think different and, and, and opportunities for growth. So did you have any type of goal for yourself in the beginning of your career or was it more just kind of happenstance? So not necessarily when I started in restaurants, that was, like I said, it kind of started out of the evolution of that. What I found out doing or working with the Montreal Expos is it's not what I wanted to do for a career. You know, baseball is great to play, but I didn't necessarily want to do the, the business of the business. 
And so I learned through this research, this is, was interesting to me, so I pursued it and had an opportunity to join Pizza Hut and then ultimately learn franchising. And once I got into franchising, that's when I started thinking about career aspirations. And very quickly, I remember going to a, um, a psychologist that helped me kind of do career planning. And this is in my first year of working at Pizza Hut. And at that point in time, I set a goal to actually be a CEO. And I had no idea what, you know, the route it would take. But that was the objective I wanted. I wanted to lead something. So, you know, whether that was entrepreneurial or, you know, working for a public entity or a private entity, that was the objective I'd set early in my career. Uh, you've had it three times and, uh, you know, and you're still crazy young. Um, so you're at Pizza Hut. Take us a little bit from there. Then, then is that when you became a franchisee or did you stay in corporate for a while? No, I left corporate. I wanted to do, I, I thought, you know, sales and marketing is the path I wanted to take. I wanted to learn that side of it. So I was offered an opportunity to run a large sales and marketing division for a company called Pierre Foods and sell the school districts, which was a channel that I was already working on at uh, Pizza Hut. Developed relationships there and ultimately ended up uh, having the chance to work within Hudson Foods and lead their national sales team. From there, um, I started doing kind of back to this co-branding. I was thinking about how do we grow this in a different way? And so we had, if you think about vending machines, probably have those on campus. One of the products we sold were these vending machine sandwiches, but they were all, you know, a random brand called Pierre. Nobody knew what it was. So I thought, what if we do what we were doing at Pizza Hut and license names of other brands to put on these products? And if we can get more, more points of distribution this way. Ultimately, we were able to do that. And so that kind of led me back to the franchise path through another means by going out and reaching out to all the people that I'd met before in the industry and saying, what do you think about licensing these products? And it just continued the conversation where I was ultimately asked to join, um, join another brand uh, to do that, which was Captain D's and, and join Captain D's to lead their franchise growth. Now, Captain D's, that's not an easy brand to sell probably at that time, or was it, you know, was it going like gangbusters? It was not. It was. It had been static for a while. It had, uh, you know, really hadn't grown for seven years. hadn't franchised for over seven years. And so, what I liked about that opportunity coming out of, uh, you know, kind of back to the industry space was, you know, rewriting a whole franchise strategy for the company, and and launching that. And that strategy was a little bit different. It started with refranchising or selling company units, um, in exchange for large development agreements or agreements to grow new units. And so that was a lot of the strategy. And it was really a strategy by, by doing that, we were able to, to help clean up the balance sheet and make the company a more financially viable by selling off company units. But in that, we were able to get growth. And so that led me back into the franchise space is, is through that, you know, Hudson Foods, then to Captain D's and seeing growth at Captain D's. And while I was at Captain D's, one of the founders or not the founders, the CEO at the time was the largest, uh, one of the largest Wendy's and Papa John's franchisee, as well as CEO of the company. And so he had some stores in Mississippi and, and he knew that I wanted to eventually run a company. So he, he, he approached me about looking at the stores and seeing if I knew anybody that would be interested in buying these stores. And as I was looking at it, you know, I said, you know, part of my development plan is eventually learn the operations, especially in the restaurant business, you need to understand the operations. So I said, what do you think about if I buy these as part of my development plan? I mean, you're, you're the CEO, you, you own restaurants outside of your day-to-day -day job. What do you think about that? And he, and it, he, he basically gave me the blessing to do that. So I would fly down on the weekends and roll up my sleeves and work in the business. And I had an operator on location and then go back on Mondays and do my day job during the week. And I did that for about two and a half years. And it was a, I was fortunate by focusing on the culture and the people on training that we were, we were really able to, to improve the stores and, and really make them profitable. And it led to me being able to attract additional investment to invest in Qdoba. And Qdoba as a franchisee it was the, the, my Harvard lesson of life is what I would call it. It was probably, um, you know, you think, you, you know, at that age, I was like, I couldn't do anything wrong. I could make no mistakes. Everything was working out in my career. And I opened three units within a year and very quickly was losing a lot of money. So I quit my job and, and moved my wife and uh, you know, have three kids. But at the time I had two with one on the way 
and said, we're not going to take a salary for the next year. I've got to go to Kansas City and we're going to figure this out. So we got to figure out how to make this work or not. And um, so after going to Kansas City and, and rolling up my sleeves and working in the business, 18 months later, I decided, um, you know, these are break even. I don't know if they're going to get any better. Um, you know, and, and rather than lose everything, continue to run these or build more, it's better if I sell them. And ultimately, I sold them. But the lessons that I learned and the challenges that you face, you know, during a crisis standpoint uh, were amazing and for what prepared me for where I am today. Um, I don't think if I wouldn't have had both the success and the failures as being a franchisee, I could be as uh, good of a leader as I am now with our franchise system. Franchise systems, uh, what I would share is uh, always have challenges. And so being able to really put the lens on of a franchisee and communicate their languages. I've been there. I remember those days when it was hard to make payroll. Also remember the days when the cash was just flowing and to, to be able to, to connect in that way just gives you a lot of credibility, but it also um, gives you a lot of empathy for what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, we tie, unlike all your analyst calls and that type of thing, we tie everything back to what 21 year old decision people who are making life decisions are. When you think about like, let's say one of those lessons, what would it be? You know, what would be kind of the, the key takeaways as you, as you look back and, you know, because I have a number of entrepreneurial folks here. Um, what, what would be kind of the takeaway that you would share with them? So, you know, one, I, th I think for this perspective, depending on the, the franchising relationship, what I always took away from it was, you know, what, no matter what business you're in, you always have to be able to put yourself in the eyes of the, the customer or, or the other person you're working with, trying to understand the conversation, the situation from their lens prior to just, you know, whether you're a leader of a company or whether you're a leader of your own entrepreneurial business, you've always got to, to be able to connect to the, the, the person you're dealing with to be able to influence them. So whether it's a guest, whether it's a um, person, I remember that advice I had from mentors, put yourself in their shoes first. And so as you're thinking about the conversation with a franchisee or a guest, a customer, what is it they want to know? What is their perspective? And in order to influence them, you're going to have to do that. So that was one of the early pieces of advice. The other piece of advice, which seems strange, is that, you know, as a young entrepreneur, especially for an entrepreneurial organization, you know, I even coach franchisees today is when you're going to go into an investment in franchises, there's, there's a matter of risk. And part of that risk doesn't mean it's always going to work out no matter how good you are. There's sometimes there's other factors that come along. So make sure that you protect all your assets the best that you can, because that's what the laws of these countries were designed to do to protect you. So you will take those risks. And often as uh, entrepreneurs, you're just off and running with, you know, bright eyes on everything's going to go great. And you kind of build your business plan um, in that mindset. Um, but often, you know, there's challenges that arise. And so make sure you've always protected your assets because that enables you to go do it again and again and again, even though you may have, you know, instances that fail. And that, that's just going to happen. And, and my example of Kidoba is that, um, you know, there's a chance I could have lost everything, but I had made sure that I had protected and structured that that didn't, that didn't occur. And so I was able to continue to invest in my Papa John's. And we're going to have some live questions, but I got a, a question online, which basically says, it's a great question. What, when you look at the two brands and, and you know, I can add a little color. I know Jack the Box of 1.0 in Qdoba. When you look at Qdoba and Papa John's, what made at that time one work and one not work so well? Yeah, I think Papa John's was interesting because it had a lot more presence. And the biggest difference in it was, you know, just really focusing on the people, the culture and the training and executing at the highest level. So we already had share in the market. Um, people knew the brand, whereas Qdoba was the opposite. We were new. We were new to Kansas City. And at the time, there was only 80 locations in the entire brand. And so if I was to do it all over again, I would go first to a market versus going head to head with Chipotle and then having Moe's and Baja Fresh and others come in. And that pie, that market share pie was split amongst four of us versus having the first opportunity to, to inform and educate the consumer in the market. I thought from my experience in the industry, I could go into a market like Kansas City and not operate, not locate Chipotle 
And I still would, I would still think that we out operated them at the time, maybe out located them on some of the locations, but we didn't split the pie and the pie didn't grow. It literally split amongst four different brands and we were all struggling to, to make it work. So I think market share is a key to franchising. You know, that's always the goal is how can you become one or two in the market? No, that makes great sense. That, that's, that's great. If you, um, you, you get back into corporate through Arby's, you progress super fast there, and then also super fast at, at Primrose. Share some thoughts about that stage when, when you're going through that type of thing. Yeah, I think for me at that point in time, um, it was the first time I had access to, um, you know, really strong leaders around me to help, to help me grow and broaden my experience, most of my experience had been in development and franchising and then that operations. Really what I gained from my time at Arby's uh, and Primrose was access to a lot of other leaders who poured themselves into me and gave me a lot of experiences beyond my, you know, my functional responsibility. And so, you know, it was also the place where I would say, you know, how do you go to that next level of leadership to lead an organization, a COO or CEO role? And that was the first time I'd had anybody, you know, really give me very, very clear feedback. And I can't emphasize it enough. And I, I remember my boss saying, you know, feedback is a gift. I'm not sure I want that gift, you know. And, and when he gave me the gift, um, it was about, Darren, won't have to worry about you getting results. You're focused on getting results. But the part that you're, you're not using to your advantage that you have a skill set in is influence. So... I'm not gonna give you the responsibility for this area of business, which is the worst thing they could have done is, meaning they didn't give me the direct reports and the budget and all that, but they said, you, you have to influence the outcome. You're gonna be held accountable for it. I'm like, so I have accountability, but no responsibility. And the answer was yes. I'm like, okay, how am I gonna do this? And so he wanted me to use my influence skills. And so I had to go out into the field and I had to connect with the teams. I had to understand their business challenges and I had to serve. And that word serve I'll use often is just basically pour myself into others without asking anything in return. So impart my knowledge, whether it was franchising, whether it was operations, whether it was other aspects of the business, without knowing, with knowing I didn't have the responsibility, but hoping that they would reach out to me again and ask for my help. And what I learned from that was while I was in those conversations, just focusing on how do I help them improve their business? they would start sharing things about, well, we have an HR challenge, we have a marketing challenge. And I would bring that to the senior executive team and say, look, I know that's not my area of responsibility, but for the good of the business, how do we fix this? And just over time, by I was helping problems that weren't necessarily my own, I was serving a broader role and helping solve bigger business problems than just my functional expertise. And that was some of the influence I started to gain within the organization. The other thing for how I built my career is also I would take on every project that, that others didn't want. <laughs> so I would take on every Skunk Works project I could take on because it was an opportunity for me to have a growth mindset and learn and continue to evolve as a leader and as a, you know, uh, an executive. I'd love to have, yeah, it's a great feedback. And it's funny because I want to emphasize one of your points because we had the exact same conversation in this class last week, which is, it is tough to realize when you're in your 30s and your 20s that constructive feedback is a gift. It's a gift because they can not say anything. They could not say anything and find a way to get you out from under their team. Um, but uh, we, had this, we had the same conversation last so, week. It, it's tough. It's yeah. tough for me to hear. Yeah, it's interesting. The first time I heard it, I, I went home. I told my wife, I said, I, we just had the best year that I've ever had in my career. And I think I'm losing my job. <laughs> and so I came back after a month of just kind of letting it absorb and, and addressing and saying, you know, I need to understand where do I stand? You know, what, and, and the, the gentleman that gave me the feedback started laughing. He said, I was hoping you would ask. He's like, things are great. We're trying to help you see it from a whole different view and go to a whole different level in your career, not just continue to do what you're doing today. Yeah, no, I, I was on a retreat with Jim Collins, the good to great guy. And my boss you know, I was probably being a little too much, as you know me, I have the app to be. And my boss said, no, nah, what are you doing here? And he gives me this whole dress down, you're privately, handled it perfectly. And I called my wife, same thing. I said, do you believe this guy? He said, and then he told me that the feedback is a gift. And she said, it is a gift. Shut up and get in line. 
<laughs> That's why we've been married 27 years. Um, so now let's talk about that first jump. So now you're 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 you know on the senior leadership number two at, at, at Primrose, but then you make the jump to number one. Tell us how that. You know, that that's is that a huge jump? Was it just you know just nice? Was it were the roles very similar? Were they very different? Um, share with, share with us share with us some thoughts about that. Yeah, I think um, there were definitely some similarities or definitely some differences. There's not one or the other. I think, um, you know, I was fortunate because I had someone that was a founder um, that was the CEO and, and, you know, chairman of the board. And they truly wanted to find their successor. And so they came in with a mindset of, you know, kind of bringing me along in the process. And so the first couple of years, I could focus on two or three area the uh, areas of the business versus trying to learn it all. And so I was able to take my time and ramp up into, you know, eventually running the entire business. So, you know, um, understanding marketing at a deeper level, brand positioning work, you know, that was the expertise of the founder. So, you know, she rolled up her sleeves and taught me that part of the business that I, that I had not had experience before. Um, franchising, I knew. Development, I knew. Um Operations, I had, had run operations, so I knew all three of those, but the area of marketing I needed to strengthen and the finance I'd had exposure to, but never had responsibility for, for IT. And so those are the last three things I took on and, you know, really, you know, made sure I understood, you know, uh, substantially. So the first couple of years is really take on one or two different areas of the business. And, you know, by, by year three, I was running the whole company uh, on her behalf. And so it was a nice a succession plan to be able to work into the role. I think the biggest thing that, you know, I learned from her was just culture and how important, you know, creating culture within an organization um, and how it can be a differentiating factor. People are, you know, I had a similar belief that people and culture are 90% of, you know, success as long as you have a clear strategy. What her challenge was as an entrepreneurial founder was she didn't have a clear strategy. Every day, there was a new idea and a bigger idea and a better idea. And so I remember my first meeting with her, uh, she had sat down and she's like, let me share my strategic plan. We have 150 items on it. And I'm like, wait a second, how many people do we have? So how do we go from 158 items to seven big things that we can really rally the whole organization around while you're teaching me culture and people? And so that, that's what I brought to the table for her while she was bringing me kind of the culture and the people side of the business and showing me how to really create culture with an organization. And I, and I want to remind everybody, again, that the, the cameras are in such a weird spot that if I look at the students in the class, um, it may look like I'm looking down. We have a question, Ethan. Yeah, hey, Darren, uh, my name's Ethan. So as you're kind of walking us through everything that you've done over the years to get where you're at today, Looking back, is there anything that you didn't do that you wish you had done um, maybe early on in career or just at any point in general? Yeah, I think, you know, I'll just give you perspective on, on Primrose. Um, and, and I would go back to um, also the thing I you know, was focusing on at Arby's, the feedback I had received is, you know, results are only one piece of the puzzle, right? The ability to influence and serve and bring people along are critical to go to that next level of leadership. And so I was wired to achieve, you know, and so I always knew I could get results, but that was the piece that, you know, really at the end of my Arby's tenure and the, it, at the start of my Primrose is where I had to focus my development as a person, because I knew it was there, I had it, but I just wasn't accessing it and using it as a tool in my toolbox. So how does that come to life? What I didn't do is I didn't go out from day one and build relationships with all our franchisees. I did it over time, but I could have got a lot, a lot of things done a lot faster by going out and investing that time into the people. And the same with the team. I was focused on strategy and execution versus I could have got a lot more done faster by that relationship building. So come full circle, by the time I get to a CC's or a Jack in the Box, guess what I was hired for? Both brands were under a relationship crisis with the franchisees. And where did I start? I started with going out into the field and just building relationship and saying, you know, even before I joined Jack in the Box, when the board had hired me, first thing I did was call 30 franchisees and said, look, we got all the time in the world to talk about business. But if we don't get the relationship right, then, you know, no matter where we are in this process, there's going to be a point in time that we disagree. 
So it's like a marriage. So we've got to figure out how to work through it. So let's start with the relationship. So it started with, tell me about yourself. Tell me how you got started. Tell me about your family. And I can't tell you enough. Um, the difference that's made in my career is by focusing first on the relationship because then we can get to the business. That's perfect. Thank you. Yeah. And it's, I also agree that it's perfect because it, it, again, it dives into this week's class, which we, these kids are stuck with me for two hours and 45 minutes every morning. <laughs> can you imagine? Um, and today's class is actually about the relationship side of franchising. Um, so, but it also gives us a great uh, introduction to Jack. Um, what inspired you to join? What um, what makes you think that it is what it, what you thought it would be? Well, let me back up because this may be interesting since it's a pop culture topic right now. The the company we work. So when I left to go to Regis, um, part of the strategy there was to launch franchising for Regis. But also try to, you know, the, the pub, private equity firm that had hired me at CC's were, was in the process of buying Regis. And my role was to come in and help them grow. And if you know, WeWork at the time was one of the fastest growing businesses in the world. Uh, lots of stories and publicity about WeWork. Movies are out now. They had attracted some $47 billion unicorn valuation. So as I went into Regis, um, which was 10 times the size of WeWork at the time, I was trying to look at how could I help a founder create value for this organization. And part of that was through franchising. And so when we heard WeWork was gonna go into the market, we thought, you know, my, my strategy for the organization was let's follow on their heels and let's go public, spin the US out and franchise it. We'll become a master franchisee of the global parent. And, and very quickly, the US business will be valued substantially more than the global business. And if WeWork gets this crazy valuation, we'll be able to ride on its coattails or we'll be able to very quickly point to why we're different and better. And within a week of the S1 being released, we knew very quickly that we had to point to why are we different? Why are we a real business? And why is this you know, uh, you know, something that you should invest in? And so what I would tell you um, during that process, you know, I learned a lot about the public marketplace. And... Um, had a deal for $4 billion to buy um, Regis, the US, the North American business uh, a month before the pandemic hit. And so oh. once the pandemic hit, um, Jack in the Box was doing a CEO search and had called me and I knew some of the board members and said, I'm in the middle of a transaction, I can't leave. And, um, and I'm, I was working in my, my chairman of my board would be a crazy founder named Mark Dixon, the, the founder of Regis. And um, I said, you know, I don't really want him as a business partner, but I made a commitment. I'm going to stick through it through this deal and uh, make sure we close out this transaction. And then the pandemic hit. And there's always a blessing in there somewhere. And that was my blessing is that the pandemic hit and, uh, and, and the deal fell apart um, in the final hour. And, um, and basically that, that industry has changed forever, um, the flexible workspace industry. And the board called me and said, are you sure you don't want to talk to us? I said, let's talk. And uh, ultimately, when they approached me, they approached me with four things. We have a relationship issue with our franchisees. They're suing us. Um, they don't like the way we've run the business or the, the prior leadership team. And that leadership team had been in place for, you know, I was the first outside CEO, meaning everybody else had come up from within. Second, uh, we think we've lost the character and positioning of Jack and, and why Jack is... Um, important to the customer, you know, being clear and communicating who our brand is and why we exist. And so third is growth. Um, and growth is going to unlock shareholder value. So we have to build more units. And the fourth thing was, you know, really what is the right story and platform that we can scale this brand? And so recently on that scale piece, what I would tell you is we just made an acquisition of Del Paco. So now we went from 2,200 restaurants to about 3,000. Um, so that was the, the you know, kind of proposal to me. And when they mount, the first thing they said, it's a relationship issue. I'm like, okay, now I'm excited. And then they said brand positioning, which is another thing I told you I learned at Primrose. And um, again, that's where I kind of get energized. And the third was when they said growth. And Jordan and I have, have worked together on growth before. Um, you know, I knew we had a, a brand with 2,200 restaurants that should have been a, nation, a national brand. And then I knew we also had the financial resources that I could take this and create a platform for building 
and, and, and plugging in other brands into the platform. And so that became an opportunity that really excited me and, and, and why I joined Jack in the Box. Well, that's perfect. Avery? Hey, so my name is Avery. This question is more so about the operations on the back end. I know during COVID especially, I noticed y'all were based out of California. Mm -hmm. How is that transition back to the office or back to potentially visiting stores going for you? In order yeah, to it's good. From it? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, uh, you know, I don't think it's interesting. Um, when I joined the organization, my leadership team or any of the team members of the team were not in the office. So I met them via video. I had some people, as you mentioned, because of California and some people being more sensitive to it out here, would not even meet with me in person that were leaders of the team because of some of their fear base. And so very quickly I had to learn a different way to, to go about doing business through you know more of a flexible mindset. Good news is I just came from Regis and that was the business we were in, right? Flexible workspace. So, um, you know, but it's still, I can tell you, it wasn't easy. You know, those, those conversations, you know, I, I, let me back up. I'm a true believer in flexible workspace, meaning creating environments that employees and, and, and people respect them as adults and, and let them do their job and get out of their way. But you also, the piece that you miss in that is as hallway conversations, what it's just learning about their family, learning about what's going on in their life, or, you know, hey, you know, and telling them what a great job they did on the last project or vice versa. And what you found, what I found myself doing and everybody in the organization was we were spending all this time on these Zoom calls, really focused on the business of the business and they would be efficient and effective, but you lose so much in between because you're missing these like connections and the, the connections with people and what's happening in their lives. And those are really what I would call the momentum builders. And so what I found us changing was that we were making sure that we would at least leave 10 minutes at the end of every meeting or the beginning to just do personal connection. And then we would actually schedule time to do fun and other things to make sure that just it was relaxed. It wasn't about business because otherwise you're like, I finished the business, hang up and you're off to the next thing. And we were losing a lot of, you know, things that were sometimes, you know, the feeling of the stress within the business, what's really happening behind that call. And, and you didn't really know what was going on. So I don't know if that answers it, but I can tell you it was definitely an interesting way to start within an organization when you know, you're a leader that really focuses on the people, but yet you wake up and you're 60 days in and you haven't, you feel like you don't really know what's happening with the people. You have to make some changes. And that's the, the, the biggest thing is I started scheduling time to just say, I don't want to talk about the business. I need to know what's going on with you. Tell me how your team is feeling. What's happening with them? Fast forward though, um, what I would tell you is that now as an organization, culturally, we've moved from an office organization to a flex working environment. So you pick which days of the week you wanna come to the office, two days a week minimum. And um, you know, at the times you wanna come in, we just ask that you, 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 know, you try to be here during specific meetings. And other than that, you get the flexibility to choose. That's fantastic. I mean, it's funny that the thing that I've learned through COVID is less even about the connection. It's when you have bright people, you're going to have conflict. And when you have conflict, and it's natural, in fact, it's helpful. Um, but when you have that conflict, and then you don't see the person the next day, so maybe you had a, a disagreement in the meeting, and the next day, if, if it was a fully five day week environment, you see them and you kind of walk by. And then three days later, you walk by, but you do the head nod. And then five days later, you kind of fix it and it's worked out. Yeah. Well, now those five times that you've seen that person is spread over five weeks. And people yeah. tend to get further and further apart, festering with some of those problems. Have you seen something like that? Does that make any sense? Am I nuts? Yeah, I thought, no, I think what's your point of conflict, I mean, it's the opposite, the avoidance of conflict. I found often, you know, you want conflict as, you know, the Jim Collins, you want conflict amongst your leaders, you, you know, positive conflict, you want them to disagree and engage in, you know, vigorous debate. And we saw less people doing that. And so, you know, we had to step back, as I mentioned, 60 days in and say, hey, look, what are we missing here? How do we, how do we do this in a healthy way in a new world? 
and not you know leave feeling like you know somebody's feelings were hurt or and we had to change the the way we did that and we had to change the way we we engaged as an organization so we could have the tough conversations that were not happening um, because of you know just a different style of communication you can't always read what person the person on the other side of the the video screen is is really thinking or feeling you just can't and um you know, I think there was a, a commercial at one point where the guy didn't realize he was actually, you know, I think is the commercial where he's on a, a conference call and he's making faces at the at the uh, machine in the in the center of the room with the intercom, and there's other people in the room, you know, and uh, you don't even realize it. And so, it's the same kind of thing. You just can't read what's going on and fully understand how people are engaging or interacting to to step in and make sure that we're having those tough conversations. Yeah, I'm, prep, I'm prepping this for the next for for 20 minutes from now when we're having class. But it is tough with email, even pre-COVID, to get emotion across. Absolutely, and you lose something with that. Um, turning to franchising a little bit, going back to it. So, what is your franchising philosophy for Jack now? Philosophy. Like, give me an example of what you mean by philosophy. Like, are you going to you know aggressively grow, attack some of the oh. new markets, perhaps east of the Mississippi? Um, really strengthen your, your core markets. Um, yeah. So for us, our first focus was get our existing base of franchisees. Our first focus was make sure our economic model was right. We had a good economic model. And then with the relationship, ask our existing franchisees to fully penetrate the markets we're already in. We're in 21 markets. Um, and we still had space in our largest penetrated market of Los Angeles. And so it was really, let's focus on getting our existing base to grow again in our existing markets. So we just signed 200 agreements to do that. And then second, it starts to say, where else do we have presence or you know, what we call our wagon wheel approach? Where do we have a kind of a hub that we can build where people have knowledge of the brand versus going across the company like the brand had done in the past with, with you know, basically a hope that people are gonna recognize us as we jump clear across to Florida. Our focus was not that it's, you know, let's go to markets outside of our core. And so our first is, uh, you know, first new market that's right outside our core is Salt Lake City. And so we're aggressively growing in Salt Lake City as an example. You know, we've already signed five people up, including corporate to invest our capital and, and four of the franchisees that we're all going to grow at the same time so we can penetrate that market and then repeat it somewhere else. So our, our method is growth, but it's to grow you know, as fast as we can grow, but in a, you know, sustainable way, starting with next to our core first, our core, then next to our core. And then once we start some momentum, three years in, we'll go to, we'll develop a regional hub. And the regional hub we've identified is we'll start in Louisville to penetrate the Southeast corridor. Well, you have Del Taco here already. Yeah. Um, and so Del Taco acquisition, that's similar. Part of the, the philosophy also is we want to refranchise. So Jack in the Box used to be a corporate model. I mean, it was mostly all corporate stores. It went through a transition um, to being a franchise model, uh, what they call asset light, or owning 90% of the franchisees, owning 90% of the business. Um, my perspective is uh, we why 90%? Why aren't we 97 or 98% franchise? So go take it to the next step and go ahead and do that. So we're gonna do that with the brand. We're gonna refranchise the, the, the remaining corporate units in return for growth. Um, and we're also gonna do the same with Del Taco. Um, what's nice about Del Taco is it overlays our current geographic footprint. It gives us scale. Um, it, they're 50% company owned and franchise owned. So we'll sell off their, fran their corporate units, giving large developers the opportunity to grow but also we have a lot of existing franchisees um, that only have the ability to grow three to five locations in their current territory. So Del Taco immediately, if I sell them five locations, they can go build 10 more right around where they already have a base of operations, which is good for them and it's good for us. And so we thought our first acquisition should be somewhere that's similar geography. So we could utilize well-capitalized franchisees that Jack in the Box had that we already know their operational patterns and they can take over some of the Del Taco and, and, and build them out. So that was part of the strategy. The second thing is, as we think about investments, it's competing in today's marketplace. We're creating centers of excellence is what I call them. I learned this at Regis. 
So where do we where do we take non-value added activities out of the business or capital intensive things in the business? And where do we both share in those centers of excellence? So for example, digital. We're investing a ton of dollars in people capital into digital. Why do two brands do that separately versus one doing it together and really focusing on where can you own a certain aspect of the digital domain? And so that's what we're doing. So we have a digital a digital uh, center of excellence we've developed and capitalized. We have a tech, you know, both of us are building tech platforms. Um, and so instead of doing that, why don't we have one? Immediately we save, you know, 10 or $15 million by consolidating. Um, so those are the things that from a shared service standpoint, our development teams will create a shared service. Our supply chain will create a shared, shared service. As an example, they have five people in their supply chain team. I have 30. Overnight, I can tell you I can drop, you know, substantial cost out of their model uh, by shared service. So shared service often enables you to get more efficient and effective at how you run the business. That's our focus. But the real value creation tool is the shared knowledge is what do I learn from you? And I'll give you an example. I was at Del Taco last week and this shared knowledge, the team was talking about one of the challenges that they had with working with third-party delivery, DoorDash, Uber, and all that. And how during the staffing crisis, they don't have the ability to just easily turn it off at the restaurant level. And, you know, the next morning, you know, the, the manager or whomever forgets to turn it back on. And this is, I'm making, I'm, I'm simplifying turning it off and on, but the reality is they're losing a ton of sales and it, it became a challenge or they're dissatisfied. The customer is dissatisfied because they want to order and, you know, certain items they're out of because of supply chain disruption right now or labor challenges. So we had just spent $2 million on a tool that would help the units, you know, basically turn or turn on or off this program and the systems needed, whether it's, you know, just you're out of French fries, you're out of one item. By learning that was a need of theirs, I immediately could add value by saying, wait, we just developed a tool we can implement in your system overnight and you don't have to invest that capital. And they had a, they had a, a similar example that I'm like, wait a second, you've already got that? I'll take that tomorrow for my staffing needs. You know, I don't, I don't need to recreate the will. Let me implement that in our business today. So that shared knowledge is where the, what I would call the flywheel takes off. That's perfect. I mean, you know, and it's funny from our shared service days at McDonald's, now these companies have kind of, they're really starting to figure it out like yours and Inspire and a few others. Going back to um, uh, the students here, when you define success, how do you define it? I mean, how do you define your personal success? You know, it's a, you know, it took me a while to figure that out for me. You know, for many, many years, I thought that was defined as, you know, just continuing to grow in my career, you know, getting the results that I was asked, tasked with. And, and, and CC's was probably the one that really brought it home for me is why, why, I, why I was put in the roles I was put in. And I remember when I was talking to the franchisees, hold on a second, Peter, can you see me okay? Yeah, so so when, when I was joined, I remember having a lot of conversation with the franchisees and they were challenged. This business was a turnaround business. And I had franchisees that were on the verge of tears and losing everything they had. You know, their college funds for their kids had been wiped out. And, you know, for me, I'm a faith, I'm faith-based. So yeah, I was given the, the administrative gifts to be able to make a difference in their lives. And so through that, by having a clear strategy, by putting a team of people in place, by executing, you know, I wake up four and a half years later and five years later, and I've impacted that, those people that, you know, those franchisees and the personal relationships I had in a big way. I made a difference and enabled them. I remember the call that I got, I still save this voicemail on my, uh, my phone from one of the fran franchisees telling me about how, you know, he had lost all the funds he had saved for his college tuition, his kid's college tuition. And then now um, his son had just entered, you know, college for the first time and all that was back, including more, you know, and those stories like that came and, and, and I had substantial number of those stories that looking back, I'm like, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. That's success for me. It wasn't about how much money I made or the next career job. It was being able to use the skills that God gave me to be able to apply them in a way that made a difference for somebody else. Oh, that's, that's, that's absolutely perfect. Um, so now at Jack, 
what what is a day? What's a day in the life of, of a CEO managing two brands? Um, half a million people work for Jack in the Box, and you know I can add Qdo, uh, add um, Del Taco to that. Um, what's a day in the life of that? Well, to be very uh, honest, I'm still trying to figure out what it's like to manage two brands. <laughs> so I'm still managing through trying to figure out how to unlock my calendar a little bit. But um, so, um, but what I would say is, I, I think you know, there's a the way I think about it is you know, planning went to a whole nother level of you know trying to map out and be very uh, uh, present in the business in both businesses and present with each individual that I, you know, I, that worked for me on a day in and day, day in day out basis. So I balance my time uh, between people, strategy. Um, and when I say people, there's a lot of constituents. So that you got shareholders. So I spend time with that. I have to, you know, plan for, I have to plan for a board. I have to plan for franchisees. I have to plan for our leadership team. And then, you know, I said franchisees, our leadership team, and then also engaging within the staff in the organization. And that staff means all the way out to listening tours to, you know, restaurant managers and team members. And so I think the majority of my time is spent around thinking about, I have a lot of target segments that I have to engage with and understand what's going on in their lives and what, how, how this business is impacting them or enabled to drive forth. And so a lot of my time is spent with the people and, and understanding what's happening within the business or what's not happening within the business. And, and planning that is, is a big deal. Next, I would say really focusing on strategy and really trying to see around the corners. Although I have a great team, you know, a lot of my job is understanding you know, strategically um, where, is, where do I want the business to go? And are we, do we have the right lead and lag indicators that are giving me insights uh, that we're doing those things and that our strategy is on target. And then the last I would say is continuing to grow and develop personally. And so some of that is just continuing to be resourceful and, you know, reading, um, whether it's reading industry, you know, knowledge and being on top of that, trying to be in, you know, out in front of it before things happen. Um, or, you know, often I'll try to read a book, you know, it used to be a book every two weeks. Now it's getting to about every three weeks. <laughs> So, good. so um, you know, I used to read a lot more, but now I think I found myself really you know, doing a lot more reading around industry and just kind of, you know, global, you know, or macro issues um, because of how much it's impacting the business than I ever have before versus more leadership type of, you know, uh, uh, trade publications or leadership uh, knowledge. So I'd say that that's a little bit of balance in my time. I would say you know, probably the area that um, we all need to get better at as, as leaders or, or many that I know is making sure there's thinking time because um, there's always more meetings than you could possibly, you know, um, take in on a day-to-day -day basis and, and, you know, decisions that need to be made. But you also need to definitely set aside time to think. And, um, and so I try to balance that. And then all, lastly, um, making time for family, making time for your personal life and, you know, staying healthy. And so I would tell you a lot of my role is, is spent planning. So I can, you know, balance between all the different things that I have going on on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, like I said, I work out four days a week and I, I just flew back from, from Dallas, Texas, where my, my, my family is still. My, two of my kids are in college. My third is a senior in high school. She's off to college at Ole Miss is where she, my youngest just decided to go. Um, so, you know, the Georgia, it's hopefully, you know, you don't hold that against her, but, um, not as good as KSU. We'll, we'll let it go. <laughs> right. Um, so I have, uh, you know, so she had a lacrosse tournament, so it's balancing between, I want to get back for the lacrosse tournament, but I also have to be here on Monday morning here in San Diego, you know, sleeves rolled up and ready to present at this meeting and, um, not at this meeting, but at meetings I had today. So you know, balancing and planning for that is, is definitely a lot of, a lot of what's critical. And again, going back to the student, the students is a good, interesting thing. So it probably doesn't happen tremendously often as your CEO, but let's say you're in a meeting and it's somebody new, 23, 24, 25 year old who might be presenting with his boss. When you look at that young person presenting to the CEO, 
what are you looking for that says this person is he's going to be good or she's going to be good you know we they have these attributes um and they don't spend a lot of time with you they're not going to again not for probably a while but you kind of i'm going to keep my eye on this person yeah i would say three things come to mind um, intellectual curiosity am i hungry to learn am i hungry to dig in and learn a little bit more and keep trying to find the root cause you know what's what's happening you know and just that intellectual curiosity you'd be amazed at how many people that I see day in and day out that don't have that, that they like that mindset of, well, we do it this way. We've done it this way forever. I'm like, but tomorrow, can't you do it just that much better? You know, just a little bit better. So if so, how? And that, and that's what I would say, intellectual curiosity leads to growth mindset. Do I have a mindset of, you can always get better. You can always make it just a little bit better each and every day. And, and that hunger there to, to do that. And the last I would say is the, the, the ability to connect with people and, you know, uh, in your own way. It doesn't have to be, you know, gregarious, but everybody, you know, that way that each person finds that, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's group settings, whether everybody has a different way to connect. And so I look for those three things because typically I find um, those three things add up to, to success. That makes sense. Um, and in terms of, you know, you get a challenge, you get a setback, that meeting with Darren Harris doesn't go so well. Putting your back, putting yourself back into that position, how do you get over that? How do you get to the next stage and, and, and keep things going? You had a pretty significant setback, as, as you shared with us, um, but this is more on a day to day. How do you, where, where do you go from there? Because there's a lot of times you go back to your desk. You're 25, 27, 35, whatever it is, and you're like, God, that, that did not go the way that it should have gone. Yeah, I think um, you know, that that willingness to learn and understand and you know, really self-evaluate what didn't go well. How can you learn from that? How can you grow? How can you um, you know, reach out to five other people that you know have been successful and help them help you understand what occurred and then start to take action from it. You know, pick one or two things from a development standpoint that you could learn and do different. You know, I thought I was a, a better operator than I was when I operated franchises, you know, and when I learned, you know, areas that I could have done better um, from from great operators, I was able to apply those. And so just keeping that uh, what I would say that open mindset um, and not thinking that, you know, you have to be the expert at everything, but supporting yourself with great people around you that can, you know, add value. And I remember being a franchisee to that point as a failure. And back then as a franchisee, and I find this all the time with franchisees, they're so busy because they have limited resource and people and time and, and money that they fail to call a, a brand and, and say, well, I know better than you. Instead of picking up the phone and saying, I've got, you know, 500 people here that want to help you. You know, I want, maybe you don't agree with their answer, but listen, they're going to give you a different perspective than maybe you have every day. And if you're open-minded to that, you don't have to, you know, have all the resources. You have people there around you. And so whatever role you're in, you have people around you that if you reach out and ask for help and say, I'm thinking about this, you don't have to take all their advice, but in there, if you learn one thing from it, it impacts your business. And often franchisees I see on a day-to-day -day basis, they get so caught up in the business that they forget to reach out and know that they have you know, a five, you know, 500 person team available to them at, you know, a moment's notice or a request. And, um, and so, you know, it's the same, I would say, hold true. When I was a franchisee, I didn't reach out and ask enough people for help, whether it was a franchisor, whether it's friends, whether it's mentors, colleagues, you know, and that was one of the things I missed about being in the corporate world when I was a franchisee is I didn't have that, but the reality is I did have access to a lot of people. I just wasn't, you know, using it. Yeah. That makes sense. Chris? Uh, hi there, my name is Chris. Um, going back to your time as a franchisee, um, what were some of the things you did to turn around those PWs that you had? I know you mentioned you got them to break even, but what were some of the things you did? Yeah, um, I, I think a few things. One is um, it started with the, the willingness to be authentic and say, I've got a problem. And going to the corporate office and you know, telling you know, a lot of people that, look, I'm challenged. 
and you know saying look i don't have all the answers and also if i continue this i'm going to be out of money i'm going to fail and so the minute i did that I, it opened up my eyes to a lot of people that had other ideas and other thoughts that i could leverage and access and not only point out the things i was doing well but also you know the encouragement point out the things i was doing well and also tell me help me kind of see the forest through the trees on what i should stop doing and i think you know more than anything that was the thing that helped the most is just being willing to just not try to carry that burden on my own, but knowing that other people were there to help me. And, and so instead of focusing on failure, I started focusing on, you know, even though I was doing activities, I started focusing on three to five things that I could really move the business forward with. And the first was, you know, people, you know, get the right people on the bus and, and make some people changes. So it wasn't having enough people, it was getting the right people. And in the Kidoba business, I had to get the right people to start with. And I went back to the basics. I trained them all over again, even though they'd been trained and, and went back to the basics, trained them again. And then I started focusing on how can I go out and market the business uh, versus the other. I started out with, you know, kind of all three at once, trying to market the business, trying to hire the team, trying to do, you know, too many things, too many priorities versus let me get the business right first and then let me go market it. That's great. Well, Darren, this has been exactly as advertised. Um, it's been pretty special for me to, to reconnect and to, to, to live vicariously through all your amazing successes. I know for the class, the ability that you've, that you've shared to, you know, how this, where the students go and what they need to do and where they need to go um, to be successful, both in a corporate environment and a franchise environment has been uh, in, tremendously insightful. So thanks so much for your time and uh, we really, truly appreciate it. Thank you, Jordan. Okay, be well. Wish you all the best. Absolutely, thank you. All be right, well. Bye -bye.